Christina, the Global Committee on Food Security, known also as the CFS with the short term, has launched a thorough consultative process to develop a zero draft of principles for responsible agriculture investments, which is to be discussed also again at the next CFS meeting in October. Um, the process wants to be broad to allow for ownership of all stakeholders. From your perspective, what is the main purpose of the principles and where's the process right now? The main purpose of the principles is to promote investment and not only investment but to promote responsible investment in agriculture to increase food security and nutrition. That's the overall goal we want to achieve. So it's not only defining principles on responsible investment, but also promoting investments because more and better investments are needed if we want to achieve food security and to increase or to reduce malnutrition. That's the overall goal of these principles. And for that, we don't need only to define these principles here in Rome, and not only to discuss this with one specific group of stakeholders, but we need to um, ensure that all relevant stakeholders are included in the process, that all relevant stakeholders are here in Rome, but, al but also um, to have consultation all over the world to raise awareness about these principles. We were talking about the process going uh, towards the CFS meeting now. Is there anything critical there that's happening now? Is it, was it all smooth or do we see anything coming there? At the moment, we have, since 1st of August, a new zero draft. It was quite complicated to develop this zero draft because we have to cover all investments. We need to address all relevant stakeholders. And at the end, the document should be short, concise, and implementable. And therefore, we faced some difficulties to prepare a zero draft that is accessible, understandable for everybody. Maybe it would have been good to stick to one thing first and then move along to the others, but I suppose you want to be all encompassing in one go. Maybe that's also a good thing when we have to address, you, when you only address one issue. There are so many other issues that have impact on this issue. I think it's important to have a holistic approach to address when we want to increase investment, increase responsible investment, to reduce malnutrition, to increase food security, you need to address all the different issues. If you lose something, maybe the whole picture uh, wouldn't fly. What is responsible? That is obviously a whole big debate, and I think that what le probably leads to the notion that the guidelines are, in the end, voluntary and non-binding, as far as I understand. To what extent can we expect, expect that governments and other stakeholders will actually use them, especially in the critical cases when core interests of core interest groups are at stake with their issues? It's a difficult question. We have the voluntary guidelines. Also, the voluntary guidelines on the governance of tenure, they are voluntary and non-binding. And you see increasing interest in certain issues or in the, in the whole document to implement. And I think that's also related. Um, the development includes all stakeholders. So all stakeholders are sitting around one table and then finally negotiating the text and the principles. And uh, when one actor doesn't want to apply the principles, there might be other actors that increase the pressure. And when you look at the different roles and responsibilities, you will have also the civil society 
which will have an important role on looking what is happening. And then you have again the CFS plenary or the CFS, so the committee, which should monitor its outcomes and outputs. Therefore, I think even when it's only voluntary and non-binding, um, the principles can be applied and will be applied because different actors will have different benefits. Not only governments, they can reduce poverty, increase productivity, maybe. And on the other side, when implementing rules and, and guides, according to these principles, they might also increase interest from other investors. And on the other side, you have investors applying these principles that can create benefits when they want to, um, for their corporate social responsibility. So uh, I think <coughs> have several facts that when, even if these uh, principles are voluntary and non-binding, it's endorsed by governments private sector mechanism and civil society organization that should help to implement. So will there be impact assessments afterwards? Who is doing them, these impact assessments? Are they sort of outside uh, uh, consultancy firms or who is doing that? And so how is this accountability ensured in the end? When you look as the roles and responsibilities for the different actors is that government should, in, uh, should establish and implement rules and procedures for assessments and reviews of impact. And governments are encouraged to uh, define accountability mechanism that will enable them to undertake improvements or remedial actions or changes. And on the other side, you have investors. And when I use the, the term investors, investor is public or private, is from small scale to, to large companies. So investors are encouraged to follow the rules and procedures for assessment and review of impacts of investments. And on the other side, you have research institutions, civil society organization, and development institutions that should play an important role in identifying possible impacts of investment and advising about possible alternatives in investment design and implementation planning. So you have the framework, what needs to be done, who is in charge of what, and at the end, it's, it's the government in consultation with the different stakeholders that define what should okay. happen in their country. Mm -hmm. So it's up to them. The right principles are supposed to be endorsed uh, next year. Uh, what are the one, two, three key steps uh, in the consultation process towards the endorsement. The consultation starts with the open-ended working group meeting in Rome on the 23rd and 24th of September and followed from, from October till January, February, we will have regional consultation in all regions addressing or including civil society, governments, private sector, and other relevant stakeholders, and all this input. In addition, there will be um, an e-consultation where stakeholders that could not cannot attend these meetings have the possibility to send their comments um, to us and based on this regional inclusive consultation, the e-consultation, we will prepare a first draft and the first draft will be negotiated here in Rome within this open-ended CFS working group end of May. And as a next step, 
is the endorsement by the CFS plenary in October 2014. Final question, always part of this format here for us, obviously, it's interview conducted with the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development. Do you see any role of the platform, the platform members, but as well in, in this uh, principles finding process? What is important and where the Global Donor Platform can contribute is in helping raising awareness among the state, your stakeholders, and um, try to increase the interest so that different stakeholders join the consultation or the, the regional consultation or join the e-consultation. I think what from our point is, is very important that the more people are aware what is happening, the more people are already now engaged within this process, the better is the product at the end. And I mean, the process is not finished in October 2014. Maybe for the process of developing the principles will be finalized, but then the next step starts in implementing the principles. And the, the sooner and the more people are aware what is going on, the faster these principles can be implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you.